Okay. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's presentation. I'm Sarah Gorecki and I'm the publisher of CMC Press Books. This evening we have Art Hoagling, who is the author of the new book published by CMC Press, Hiking Safety Handbook. Um, Art is going to cover core skills that can be applied to either hiking or backpacking. These include the 10 essentials, lightning safety, fire, what to do if you get lost, animal encounters, and more. Hiking Safety Handbook will be 25% off during tonight's um, presentation using the code HIKESAFE25 at our website, which I will put in the chat in just a few minutes. And now for some friendly Zoom reminders. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with using Zoom by now, but please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. And just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. Please ask all of your questions in the chat box. Um, we, we can take some questions as we go, and there will be a Q&A at the end. And now to introduce um, tonight's speaker. Art Hoagling has taught wilderness safety for over 25 years, is a wilderness first responder, a certified first aid instructor, a master wilderness safety instructor, and a member of the Wilderness Medical Society. He co-founded and is current director of the CMC's Hiking Safety Seminars, and I'll put a link to the next one in the chat as well. And now over to you, Art. Welcome. Um, thanks for all being here tonight, and thanks for being interested in hiking safety. Um, usually when we give these talks, uh, being here in Golden, Colorado at the Colorado Mountain Club and the uh, American Mountaineering Center. Most of our audience is folks who have moved to Colorado from someplace else. So raise your hand if you if you've moved to Colorado from someplace else. Okay, a lot of pretty much everybody's hand went up and uh, that's pretty typical. My wife and I moved to Colorado from uh, Ohio and when we got to Colorado, we had quite a bit of experience from back east where we had backpacked and kayaked and hiked a lot. And we felt we were pretty experienced. So we headed out on the trails here um, and started, went on our first backpacking trip. And my wife broke her leg. She was seven miles from the trailhead. It was starting to be night. And um, we, we had quite an adventure. Back in Ohio, if you fell down on a trail, you just walked a block or so, and there was a house there um, and somebody who could help you out. But out here, there was nobody. So um, that happened to us a couple of times. And we decided, you know, we don't know as much as we think we know. Um, and we don't know what we don't know. So we got real serious. We took survival classes. We joined the Colorado Mountain Club. We took just about every class that the club offered. And fortunately, we, we had a lot of uh, good experiences and have learned quite a bit over the years that hopefully we can share with you tonight. And again, we're here in Colorado and Colorado is real different than Ohio. And it's real different than other parts of the country. And so, um, you know, even if you have, we've had people who've taken our course who are, uh, from uh, areas where there's a lot of outdoor activity, but there's still certain things in Colorado that are unique that we're just going to touch on here to kind of highlight why we're why we are different. Let's see if I can get this clicking here. We have high altitude. Obviously, Colorado is the highest altitude state in the lower 48. Um, the lowest point in Colorado is higher than the highest point of the vast majority of states. So that's real different. Uh, we have a lot of elevation gain on our trails. Um, they seem to go up and up and up. In fact, there's an old joke in Colorado uh, that says that no matter which direction you're hiking on a trail in Colorado, it's 80% uphill. We also have dramatic temperature changes. Uh, a year ago, I was camping in a wilderness area. Uh, it's a wonderful one if you live in this in the western part, eastern part of Colorado. Um, the Lost Creek Wilderness Area is a great one to check out in the spring. It, it melts out before most areas and so forth. But last fall, I was there, and during the day, the temperature was 85 degrees, and at night, it got down to 28 degrees. 
that that would have never happened back in Ohio. In Ohio, it would have been 80 degrees during the day and 79 degrees at night. So that's real different. We have sudden electrical storms. If you've lived here any time at all, you know about these afternoon monsoons that roll in in the summer. Um, we have year-round mountain snowstorms. Uh, it gets last two years ago on July 4th, I was on uh, Beerstadt Peak and we got about three inches of snow in July. Um, we have a, a horrible beetle kill epidemic that's been going on for three decades in Colorado. Uh, it's decimated a lot of our spruce and pine forests and Many of you have probably seen these uh, dark forests where the whole slope is uh, killed from pine bark beetle. Um, again, it's been going on for decades. And by 2017 in Colorado, 95% of lodgepole pines in Colorado have been killed. Um, so it creates these ghost forests, which are a very dangerous thing, particularly if you're um, hiking through them on a windy day, you're never quite sure what's what's going to happen. Um, we have wildfires. Uh, we've been having these mega fires. Fortunately, last year was a good year. Um, the uh, We're not sure what this summer will look like. We had a very wet winter, as many of you know, and that actually in some ways works against us because it uh, causes a lot of brush and grass to grow that is uh, conducive to wildfires. But we've had years of drought in Colorado. Um, you're well aware of that. And these mega fires um, are getting more and more common. We also have avalanches. Avalanches happen year round in Colorado. Uh, in the summer and the spring, we get these wet avalanches. Uh, and then the rest of the year, we get these dry avalanches, which are the powdery, fluffy ones you see on uh, TV and so forth. And then we have wild animals. Um, you are not necessarily the top of the food chain here in Colorado. Uh, we have a lot of uh, apex predators. We also have non-predators that can be dangerous, uh, such as timber rattlers and other kinds of rattlesnakes. So that's the what makes Colorado a little dangerous. But um, it can also uh, be deadly in many ways. Last year in Colorado, there were 40, 48 backcountry deaths uh, from all the various outdoor activities. Uh, each year, an average of 13 climbers die on the Colorado 14ers, some years more. Uh, our famous and wonderful Rocky Mountain National Park, which the Colorado Mountain Club, where I am now, helped get started back in uh, the early part of this last century. Um, it has been rated as the fourth most dangerous park in the country and has one of the highest levels of search and rescue call outs. And speaking of search and rescue call outs and teams, Colorado, uh, there was a major study done of search and rescue in Colorado this last year. And the data shows that Colorado has the highest number of search and rescue teams, search and rescue call outs uh, or emergencies that these teams have gone on of any of the 50 states. The rescues were for a wide group of outdoor folks, climbers, hunters, snowmobilers, and so forth. But 94% um, of the rescues are in hikers and backpackers. Um, it's, there's a number of reasons for that. One big one is, is that pretty much anybody can head out backpacking. It's, it's easy to show up at a trailhead and head out where some of the other sports like skiing and hunting and so forth require uh, specialized training, expensive equipment and so forth. Plus, there's, if you've been around Colorado the last few years, you've heard of the surge, which is where the uh, trails are uh, getting really well used, which is a good thing in, in many ways. Um, and what this has led to is a, and this study I just mentioned uh, clearly calls this out, uh, our volunteer search and rescue teams are experiencing extremely high rates of burnout, injury, and uh, stress injury, and physical injury. So I want to compliment you. Um, every time one of our search and rescue teams go out, they are putting their life on the line. Uh, it's a pretty nerve-wracking thing to get a call in the middle of the night and 
get amped up and drive someplace fast in your car, and, um, maybe in the worst weather, usually in the worst weather. Um, and so you, by taking this class and other, other classes in safety through the Colorado Run Club, are being highly responsible. Uh, you're one of the good guys. Uh, you're the folks that uh, want to be safe out there. You don't want to add to those statistics I just read. Um, and where possible, you want to learn skills so you can self-rescue. You should always call for help uh, if you need to and call search and rescue. But it's far better if we can avoid having to do that uh, by either being well-prepared or being able to self-rescue. So um, you're learning those skills and life-saving techniques um, uh, is a wonderful thing. And I compliment you for doing that. So we're gonna, this class is gonna cover three separate areas. We're gonna talk about uh, things to do to be safe before you head out, before you get on the trail. Then we're gonna talk about things to do at the trailhead that'll keep you safe. And then we'll finish up with talking about skills that'll be valuable to you when you are out on the trail. And normally when we teach this class, we do it for three hours. Um, I'm shooting for 45 minutes here, so um, I'll keep it moving along and uh, we'll see how much we can, we can cover. I'm, I'm certainly gonna try to get to the most important things. And one of the most important things is we strongly recommend everybody in Colorado who hikes purchase a Colorado Outdoor Recreation Search and Rescue card. And you can see what one looks like in the corner up there. And this is a card uh, called, we call it the Corsar card also. Um, you pay for it. Uh, you go through the Colorado uh, Parks Department, basically through their, what used to be their Division of Wildlife. And the card is not an insurance card where they uh, pay for rescues uh, bills that you might get or something like that. But rather the money from this card goes into a fund. And then that fund is used to uh, provide supplies to our search and rescue teams. When you go out on a search and rescue, you um, are using your own gas, you use your own food, and lots of times your equipment is uh, destroyed and so forth, so um, or used up. So um, if you have one of these search and rescue cards, you share it with the people who are rescuing you, they take the number from it, they turn it into this uh, fund, and then they can be reimbursed for their, their costs. So it's a very helpful thing. and. Um, it's something, since I've shared with you, that we're the responsible good guy group. It's really something we want to have. They're inexpensive. It's $3 for one year, $12 for five years. I understand the legislature is looking at raising the price of it in the near future. You can buy the card at places like REI or most outdoor shops. You can buy it here at Colorado Mountain Club as well. So um, that's a good citizen thing to do. And uh, we hope everybody does that. The search and rescue teams will still rescue you if you don't have one of these cards, but they might drop you less times carrying you out if, if you do if you do have one of those cards. Um, the other thing you should have, uh, paperwork wise, before you start out, is a personal information form. And this is um, part of a card series that Colorado Monk Club started about 10 years ago called the Incident Management and First Aid Card System. Um, this card, um, which is uh, on, on the uh, website here, uh, on the Zoom screen, uh, is entitled Personal Information Card, and it's the first of seven cards. This one is designed for hikers and outdoors people to put in their first aid kit. You fill in this information. Um, it's, it's your name, date of birth, uh, blood type, age, and who to notify in case of an emergency. And it also lists your medical background. And we've trained thousands of first aiders, wilderness first aiders at the Colorado Mountain Club over the recent years. And in every training, we ask that people who take the course fill out this card and carry it in their first aid kit. So obviously I can't give you one of these cards. If you step by the office here, there's a supply that you can pick up. Um, if, you, if you'd like to have one, if you, if you don't have an opportunity to get one of the cards, please write down that same kind of information and carry it in your first aid kit. Colorado first aiders 
most uh, wherever they're being trained in Colorado are taught to look in your first aid kit if they are treating you for an injury. Uh, and particularly, they will do that if you're unconscious. It gives them information that can help them help you. So uh, please do that. Um, another thing that is very worthwhile if we head out is to look at some of the literature out there. That photo shows some of the over 100 trail guides that the Colorado Mountain Club Press produces. Uh, there's a trail guide for just about any place you'd like to go in the West, uh, and particularly Colorado trails. And it's a handy thing to do a little research before you go out on the trail. The guides list specific uh, safety issues that might be relevant to that trail. Uh, they guide you to the trailhead. They provide some great color, and there's always a little map in there, too. Um, the books are kind of on the heavy side, so you don't want to carry the whole guidebook with you when you go out. But you do want to Xerox the section that relates to the trail you might be taking uh, and take it with you out on the trail. Okay, so... We've all heard of uh, the principle of uh, leave no trace, which is where responsible outdoor folks go out of their way to not litter or not uh, cause issues in the wilderness and to keep a clean camp and to uh, uh, protect our um, public lands. Uh, this is not leave no trace, this is leave a trace. We do want you to leave a trace when you're heading out. And this yellow form that you see on the right is a sheet we worked on over a number of years. It's basically a trip plan. And you fill this out and you uh, put into it what location you are going to, where you're going hiking, when you expect to be back. Um, and then you leave it with a family member or a friend or some reliable neighbor uh, who will if you do not come back by the time you say you are going to come back, then they will call for help for you. So what you wanna do is put your, uh, the date you are traveling, your starting time, your trailhead. Uh, when you read the card, you'll see all the different things that uh, it asks you to fill in. And it also has um, what to say on there. If you look at the bottom, it tells that neighbor of yours uh, what to say when they call when they call for help. So you want to put a time and you want to leave some uh, wiggle room in that time for when uh, a person should call. Uh, there have been times when I left one of these with my wife. Uh, I told her I'm going to be back at the trailhead at five o'clock. And she always says, please give me a call uh, when you're there at the trailhead. And there's been a bunch of times I've gotten back to the trailhead and um, there's no phone service at the trailhead. And it's like an hour or so before I reach a, a place where I can call her. So you want to leave yourself some wiggle room um, on that as well. Okay. The, um, that trip plan, the leave a trace plan is also in our new hiking safety book. It's in one of the appendices. You can just copy it out of there. Um, if you don't have our book, you can go to the Colorado Mountain Club website and look up the out hiking safety seminar school. And we have a website there that lists all, has all our paperwork and you can copy, make copies from there. All right. When you're heading out, you always want to check the weather. Uh, never fail to do this. Um, and I think probably everybody knows this, but City weather is not the same as mountain weather. It, it can be dramatically different. Most of our get, us get our weather from our cell phone, our TV, or our radio. Um, and that's fine for certain things. Uh, TV news is particularly good at showing fronts that will be coming through. And you can get like several days worth of what's going to maybe hit. And that's handy. But by far, and having reviewed just about every weather option there is out there, um, all of our instructors uh, will tell you that weather.gov, which is by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, uh, is by far the best uh, weather site to use. And it's good for many reasons. Um, again, when you're heading out for a day, you want to know what the weather's going to be like out on the trail. 
But you always want to also, even though if it's a day hike, you also want to check what that night's weather is going to be. You want to take enough gear with you so that you can survive the night in case you have an unexpected night out and you can't come home. So when you're checking the weather, always check the day of your trip and the night of your trip and be prepared in case you don't make it back to have gear with you to survive that night. Um, if you look at the little uh, graphic down there, the photo, that is a screenshot of what you get, one of the uh, pages you can get when you go to weather.gov. And not only does it have the little symbols, uh, it also has a, some prose outline of uh, what the forecast can be up to seven days. It's, strict, it's, a, it's amazing what this website can do. Um, not only can it tell you what the weather is coming, it can tell you what the weather was yesterday, it can tell you what will happen next week. Uh, it can tell you uh, whether stream crossings are going to be possible a month from now. It can tell you if there's snow on the ground where you're going or if there was snow on the ground yesterday and it's going to be muddy. If you get to learn this site, it's, it's dramatic of how amazing it is. It's almost sort of Star Trek uh, science or something of how uh, good these forecasts are. If you look at the bottom right corner, there's a little topo map down there, a little green topo map. And there, there is a, in the middle of it, there is a square. And on the uh, map, that square is 2.5 kilometers square. And that is the exact spot of where this forecast is for. So this, this uh, one I did here was Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, you're all familiar with that. That's the entryway to uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, a, a fun place to visit. Um, and if you go on TV, if you uh, look around, it's pretty easy to get the weather forecast for Estes Park. This sheet here gives you the forecast for Estes Park, um, but it also allows you to drag that little green box five miles west to say Bear Lake in, Estes, in Rocky Mountain National Park. So um, you have the forecast for Estes Park, but you're going to leave Estes Park and get up early in the morning and head into the park and hike up to Bear Lake. Well, Bear Lake is about 3,000, 4,000 feet higher than Estes Park. The weather drops dramatically a thousand, uh, for every thousand feet, you lose about three degrees of temperature in Colorado. And so the weather at that trailhead will be quite different than the park, than the uh, uh, weather in Estes Park. If you get good at using this weather.gov system, what you'll do before each trip is go to your trailhead, wherever it is in Colorado, put that little green box on the trailhead, and you will not only get the, you will get a precise weather forecast for that particular trail, the two miles within the range of that trail starting. So it's, it's dramatically better than uh, anything else you can get, use. And it's, it's really a, a very worthwhile thing to learn how to use. All right, the other thing before you hit the trail is the uh, checking for fire. Fire is a big deal, of course, in Colorado these days. Um, we got a little lucky this winter. The drought went off on the drought monitors, but in the last two weeks, drought has come came back. I checked it for today for Golden, where I am right now, and we are listed as a D2 drought going on in Golden, uh, which is a um, level two drought. Um, so we, even though we've had a wet winter, we're, we still got a lot to deal with. So all fire authorities have agreed upon a unified system. And you've probably seen these car, these signs around when you're driving up into the mountain. It's really smart to figure out where they are and remember where they are and check them every time you go through. Um, on the one on the left is called a barometer sign. The one on the right is, of course, Smokey the Bear. And the fire departments check, change these depending on what the risk is. Right now in Evergreen, we had four inches of snow last night where I live. And when I came by the sign today, it said high fire danger. Um, I even got good sound effects here for this. Um, the fire department is right across the street from our building here. I don't know if you can hear them rolling out over there. Um, so you want to check the fire uh, 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 level before you head out. You also want to know um, fire 
bans and fire warnings are set by county. Uh, county sheriffs are, we think of them as law enforcement, but they are also the chief fire officers for each county in Colorado. So when you say if you're heading up to the Frisco area, you want to uh, contact, if you're worried, if it's a fire season, you're concerned about fire, you want to go on the website and check with the Grand County Sheriff's Office and see what, if any, fire bans they have in effect. In recent years, there's been dozens and dozens of fire bans across the summers, and we've all experienced the smoke and the danger that we, we see from that. So you really want to be careful and clued into that. Okay. When heading out, you always want to carry the 10 essentials. The 10 essentials was a list of hiking gear and climbing gear that was invented by the Mountaineers, the Seattle Mountaineers, a famous hiking club who's a partner of Colorado Mountain Club that's located in Seattle, Washington. And they came up with this list in the 1930s and it's been revised and updated over the years. But basically, whenever you hike, if, unless you're going to like Cheeseman Park or something like that in Denver, uh, any trail that has significant wilderness on it or outback, you always want to carry the 10 essentials on any trip that you do. Some of them change depending on the seasons, uh, but basically, um, this is a key list. And what it will do, it will help you survive the night. Um, and if you get real good at the safety stuff, and obviously you folks are interested, uh, you won't be having to spend the night because you'll be traveling safely, but you can use the same gear to help other people out there uh, who might be in trouble and need your assistance. So one of our senior instructors or master instructors, a gentleman by Steve Billig, uh, took this list and he created an acronym of SNIFFER, and it's a way to help remember this because it's a little tricky to remember this list all the time. So um, the word is pronounced sniffer, and that includes all of the elements of the 10 essentials. So when you're planning on your trip, at, you know, think about sniffer and think through, walk through it and think, do I have all of the items for my trip? And so real quick, um, you want to have some kind of shelter. Uh, in the old days, the earlier list never mentioned shelter, but equipment, shelter equipment has gotten so light these days that you can even carry it um, on, a, um, on a day trip. In the old days, you'd have to carry a tent. It could have been five to 10 pounds, and most people wouldn't carry that just for a day hike. But if you look on here, I see that little solo bivy sack. A bivy sack is a basically a, a waterproof sack, a breathable waterproof sack that if you're stuck out overnight, you can get into. Um, and it will help you survive the night. Um, bivy stands for bivouac, uh, which is a French word. There's an old joke that bivouac, bivouac means is the French word for mistake. Uh, it's a mistake if you get stuck out. You don't want to bivouac if you don't have to. Uh, it's very, very unpleasant. But that sack will help get you through it. Another thing that works well if you don't have a bivy sack is garbage sacks two big black garbage sacks, the kind that contractors use, the heavier volume ones can make a, a very handy bivouac. And you can do a lot of different things with those. Uh, in the book, there's like 20 different things that you can do with those black sacks uh, to help you survive. So sun protection's on our list. Uh, you see here, sun tan lotion, uh, sunglasses, um, the, you're up higher, the UV rate is much higher in the mountains than uh, in Ohio or places like that. So uh, sunglasses are uh, pretty important year round. Navigation, um, a map and compass is very valuable. Our cell phones have wonderful uh, GPS apps in them now, but they also are electronic and they're subject to uh, running out of juice, uh, their batteries go dead and you can drop them and break them. So it's really wise to have a map and a compass and know how to use them. And the, the National Geographic map, you can see one on the picture here. Those are terrific maps for us in Colorado. Uh, the, it's the National Geographic uh, Society that puts those out. And they, of course, they're headquartered in Washington. But their mapping headquarters is here in Evergreen, Colorado. Um, so the, the, uh, I've talked to their cartographers there, 
uh, when I was writing his book and so forth. Um, they're an amazing bunch of outdoor people and geeky people. And the Colorado maps, I'm sure they wouldn't say this, but are really kept up to date because all the people in that office are hiking these trails all the time. Uh, so their trails are really up to date. Their maps are waterproof um, and they will keep you, uh, uh, you can, they'll keep you dry if you have to pull one over you and so forth. The single best thing about them though is maps are made for different purposes. You have maps that airline pilots use. They have maps that uh, um, um, you use when you're driving in your car for locations. These maps are designed for hikers uh, and backpackers. So the trails are really well shown very well. But in addition, what is particularly useful is these folks have put a different color line around each different land entity that you might be visiting. In other words, there's a green line around national parks. There is a blue line around national forests. There's a brown line around BLM land. Uh, uh, county parks have a different color around them. That's really valuable because when you're checking, if you're calling for help, you need to know whose zone you're in because there's different rescue teams in different counties that serve different areas. These maps also are very clear on what about delineating county lines. Uh, again, if you call for help, you can try calling 911, but 911 will turn you over to the counties because in addition to being responsible for fires, county sheriffs are responsible in Colorado for all search and rescue. Now they may farm it out to a group like um, the Alpine Rescue Team or something like that and have a contract with them. But bottom line, county sheriffs are who you wanna be dealing with. Okay, nutrition. You wanna carry extra food, you wanna carry extra water. Um, you wanna have enough food that uh, you, you wanna take your lunch on a hike and your water and your drink and so forth, and your snacks. Uh, but then you wanna take extra food that is beyond what you would use that day. Um, and a lot of people take food that's not very appetizing, so they're not tempted to eat it. And it can last on their back and be there in an emergency. So you wanna have enough food like uh, power bars or something that'll get you through the night in case you're stuck out there. Um, it's also pretty handy to have water tablets, things that can purify water. Uh, so you can take stream water and use some iodine and um, purify that or other forms of water purification. And then we're on to I, we wanna talk about insulation. Um, in the back, you can see a little foam pad, a little yellow insulite foam pad that unfolds. Having a foam pad like that is a very valuable thing. You can sit on it. Um, uh, if you're stuck out overnight, it's one warm place you'll have to sit on. They fold up small and they'll stay in your pack. For every pack I have, I cut out a piece of insulite foam and uh, make it fit the back of the pack against my back. Uh, and it just lives in my pack, just stays there. And it's there if I need something to sit on or an emergency. Um, in addition for insulation, you wanna have that little blue thing up in the upper corner is a down jacket. It's a very lightweight down jacket. Um, it just lives in my pack year round, it's always there. The yellow thing is a rain jacket. You wanna carry a rain jacket and you wanna carry rain pants uh, all the time. Best kind of rain pants are kind that zip on the side. So you can get them over your boots, you're less inclined. When it starts to rain, you're more inclined to just keep walking. But if you can put your wearing pants on without having to do too much effort because they've got good zips on the side, uh, they'll do a better job for you. Illumination, for years we'd say carry a flashlight. Now everybody carries headlamps. Uh, they are so much more useful than a flashlight. Um, headlamps, uh, they free your hands up. So for hiking poles or whatever you're doing. And you wanna carry spare batteries for that headlamp. Um, you can do that in a little plastic bag. And then you wanna carry fire starter. On our picture here, you see that orange container that has waterproof matches in a waterproof container. And the red thing below it is a little Bic lighter that you can buy for a buck at a 7-Eleven store. Uh, you wanna carry two sources to start a fire. And then you wanna carry some kind of fire starter. Uh, in case the wood is wet and you're trying to get a fire going in an emergency, um, you want something that's gonna burn for about 10 minutes um, that will burn well. Um, one of the things a lot of people carry that doesn't cost much is cotton balls. 
they take a little Ziploc bag, fill it with cotton balls, and uh, take those cotton balls and dip them into uh, Vaseline. Those will burn great. So there's, you can buy professional fire starters, but that will work. Some people take dryer lint and carry that. That'll burn well and get going. Um, you can uh, use various things for your fire starter, but you need you need to have something that'll always be there in emergency that'll burn hot uh, no matter what's going on. If you have potato chips, if you have Cheetos, those things burn like little volcanoes. Um, you can start a fire with those if you have them in your lunch and you need to get a fire going. Okay, and the last few things are you wanna carry some repair kit items. What you see there is a little ball of duct tape. Um, you can buy little ones like that at outdoor stores that are very handy. Uh, or you can just take your duct tape from your shop at home and just wrap some around your water bottle like that uh, Nalgene bottle up on top there and have that with you. It does, after a year or two, doesn't work anymore. So you need to change that out every year or so. And then finally, communication. Uh, you want to carry a whistle. Uh, just before I get off a repair kit, point out to you in the bottom there a little um, Swiss Army knife. Very handy thing to have. Um, we don't need those big for 99% of what we do in Colorado. You don't need the big hunting knives, the, the Bowie knives. A little knife like that with maybe a scissors in it, a file, uh, and a tweezer, which is very important, um, will be of, of good use to you. And then communication, you want to have a whistle of some sort. So many of our packs come with whistles on them now. You want to buy the loudest possible whistle you can find. Um, the ones on the pack are okay, but they're not very loud. Uh, you can buy a, 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 a much louder whistle uh, for a couple of bucks. Do not take a metal whistle in the winter. Those will freeze. Um, and don't take a whistle with a ball in it that you've seen sometimes because those balls will freeze up in the winter. So um, now I've just gotten through all this equipment. That's stuff out of my pack there. Last night when I was putting, or last week when I was putting the slideshow together, I added up how much all that equipment cost. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, there's also a, a rescue beacon in that pile there, which costs about $300. And I didn't mention that. That's a, a personal locator beacon that will call help for you in an emergency. Um, this a pile of gear there, throwing in my pack and my hiking poles, I'm up to about 1500 bucks. And if you're new and you're starting out, you do not need to have this. People, when they sign up for our classes, will see that it says, bring your 10 essentials. And you should do that. But uh, our instructors this year put together a list of bargain 10 essentials, all really good gear that we've all field tested. And the we our list came in at around $150. Um, that will get you started. And it's all good gear that will be good for uh, most hikes. So um, in our book, our new book, there's an appendix in the back and it has a list of uh, that gear um, and uh, it'll get you by for about um, 150 bucks, get you started. Okay, we're out there now, we're at the trailhead. When you're there, there's some safety things you wanna do. You wanna hydrate. It's much easier to tank up at the trailhead. Uh, it'll save you weight carrying out. You wanna take water with you, of course, but you also wanna fill up right at the trailhead. Uh, it's easier to carry the water inside of you than in your pack. You wanna put sunscreen on at the trailhead. Again, we're in Colorado, we're up high. Uh, a lot of sun injury happens here. And you wanna get your map out, your trailhead Australia map, and you wanna orient the map and figure out where you are, find that trailhead on the map. I like to draw a little circle on it because then when I'm out and I'm trying to figure out where I came from, I can get back to it quicker. And there's a technique called, we're not teaching navigation in this course much, but uh, there is a technique everybody should know called orientation. That's where you take your compass and the compass always has a red arrow in it, which you can see in the picture there. And that red arrow always points north. And the top of the map is always north. Um, with rare exceptions, maps, all the top of maps are always north. So what you want to do is put your map um, on, not on your car hood, because it's magnet, it's the, the metal in the car will influence the magnet. Put it on the ground or a picnic table. Lay your map out, put the compass next to it, line your map up so it's pointing north to, to match the compass. 
And then uh, look around at the trailhead and see if you can see some of these landmarks that are near the trailhead and get a feel for the topography as you're heading out. Um, there's a more skills in the book you can learn uh, th that'll help you uh, find different places where that can actually using a map and compass wherever you are, you can figure out uh, if you're lost where you are using that map and compass uh, using a technique called triangulation. It's a good skill that you can learn pretty easily. It's in the book. Um, you at the trailhead, figure out what your elevation is. That's a pretty handy thing to help you navigate. Uh, it'll tell you if, if you know you're at 7,000 feet and uh, you're heading up to nine, it'll help you plan what you're doing there. Um, most trailheads will have these days have a kiosk. You can see the one there for Lamar River. That's a kiosk. You'll see those on trails all over Colorado and all over the West. Um, they basically are information about the trail. Uh, this one here has a map on it. Um, it's they're really worthwhile. You get kind of jaded because they're always on the trailhead. Don't skip them, read them. They're real important to, uh, for safety information. Uh, this particular one, for example, if you look in addition to the sort of canned information that's up on all of these, the bottom one has a brand new warning that was just put up that there is a carcass, an animal carcass along the trail you're going to be heading on. And you want to know such things like that because those attract grizzly bears or other bears that could be very dangerous. So always check out the kiosk. Um, check if you have cell phone reception and be sure to set a turnaround time. Um, you can take a photo of the map that's at the kiosk to back up your regular mask. And as you start out on a trail, oftentimes you'll see these signs Take a picture of any signs like that because it's hard to remember what they say when you're a mile or two up the trail. And most trails these days have these sign-in boxes where you can sign in and sign out. Um, if they have one, be sure to do that. Okay. Um, be sure you know where your car keys are when you're heading out. Um, hide any items in your car. We're getting more and more break-ins in vehicles these days. Uh, so you want to be alert to that. Um, people, there was a rash of break-ins in cars in Seattle at trailheads, and what the thieves came up with is they would break into your car and then take your driver's registration with your address on it, and knowing that you were out on the trail, they would drive to your house and then break into your house. It was a pretty awful thing, so do not leave your address in your car. Okay, now we're out on the trail, so we want to you want to watch for trail markers. Every different kind of trail has a different type of marker. Uh, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, there is what's called a blaze there where people have uh, hacked into a pine tree. Um, usually this is the forest service. They look like uh, the letter I with a dot over it. Um, those are still used and they still use them on trails. And um, the key thing with this is you want to, when you're on your trail, you want to uh, be very mindful of what trail markers are on your particular trail. Are they all blue uh, plastic uh, diamonds or are they all red metal markers? Because if you're hiking along, you're following the blue markers on the trail uh, and all of a sudden you find yourself following yellow markers, it means you've probably gotten off the trail you wanted to be on and that could be a mistake. Uh, so you want to be alert to that. The pile of rocks there you see is called a carn. Uh, sometimes they're called a duck. Um, those are often used to mark trails above timberline where there's not any trees. Um, uh, they are not very reliable. Um, they get knocked over and people put them up for reasons other than marking the trail, maybe to mark a fishing spot or something like that. So you cannot, you, they're usually okay enough, but you, you can't trust them 100%. Okay, lightning. Colorado has the third most highest amount of uh, lightning strikes of any state in the country. The first two are Florida and Alabama. Uh, we have a lot of lightning deaths and injuries. Um, the safest place to be is in a house or a building where uh, the building protects, run, if lightning hits a building, it will run through the plumbing or the, electric, the electrical work in the house and ground itself. Um, 
But if you can't be in a building, um, a car is a good place to be. The metal part of the car will uh, carry lightning around you. If you're out on a trail and lightning comes along, try to get back to your car. It's the safest place to be. If you are in a car, try not to touch anything metal. A classic thing for hiking in Colorado is to be off the summits um, by noon, be off the ridges by noon. We get these afternoon storms that come in. Uh, you want to avoid standing next to single trees or poles, anything single, because lightning will hit the highest spots around. Stay away from water. Water, uh, lightning will transfer through water. Uh, so be aware, get off of water if you're in a boat or something like that. Stay away from marshes, beer ponds, gullies. Um, if you're out with a group hiking and lightning overtakes you, spread out. Spread your group out at least 50 feet apart and try to make sure that you can see everybody in the group and talk to everybody, but be 50 feet apart. That way, if, you, if somebody is hit by lightning, there'll be other people there who can provide first aid or go for help. Try to be the lowest person around. If lightning is coming down around you, uh, remove any metal items like uh, hiking poles. A lot of hiking poles these days are uh, carbon fiber. Carbon uh, will conduct um, electricity, so set those things apart. apart. Um, in Colorado, we have these monocultures of trees where uh, the forests are one type of tree. Uh, you see these when you're driving up I-70, the whole uh, slope covered with one kind of pine tree or so forth. That's a good place to get into in a lightning storm. In the east, the forests are um, diverse with a lot of different types of trees, some big, some tall. But our, here we have this sort of uniform canopy, and that makes it a little safer place to be. Okay, if you can't get to a safe place and you're stuck out there, you can assume what's called the lightning safety position. This is a last resort thing to do. You don't want to do this unless you have no other option. The picture on the left, the lady standing there, um, she looks like she's just standing, which is something you should do if lightning's coming down around you, but she has her heels touching. And the reason she's doing that is lightning, 50% of the time, it's not a bolt of lightning that gets you. That's only happens about 5% of the time, but 50% of the time what gets you with lightning is electricity traveling through the ground. And it can go about up to 200 feet from where the lightning strikes. So if you have your heels together, what'll happen is the lightning will go through one foot through the other foot and continue on. Where if your feet aren't touching, the lightning will go up through your body, through your organs, and then out your other leg, a much more dangerous situation. Um, if you can do this and you got a pad or something insulation insulated that you can sit on, like the, lady, the photo in the middle, do that. You want to have as little part of your body touching the ground as possible. Um, the photo on the right is the best position to be in. This woman is squatting on her toes with her heels touching, uh, but that's almost an impossible position to stand in or to stay in for very long. I can do that for about two minutes. So what most people end up doing is the center position. You're getting down low. You have fewer parts of your body touching. You'll notice she has her hands covering her ears because of the concussion uh, will break your eardrums from a lightning strike. Uh, you can't see this, but she has her eyes closed because of the lightning flash that can blind you temporarily. Uh, and she has her mouth open uh, to help the concussion um, dissipate and that uh, it's like military people learn when bombs are going off, open your mouth because of the concussion. Okay, I'm gonna try to get us through here in just a few more minutes. Wildfire. We have this horrible mountain multi-year drought going on. We are in the driest two decades in literally 1,200 years in the West. Um, our fire system is now 70 days long. Our fire season is now 70 days, 70 days longer than it was just one generation ago. And you know we're getting these year-round fires now. Most fires are caused by uh, um, net, um, people. Most of them are caused by man. Um, natural fires, the majority of them are caused by lightning. Um, and the leading cause of fires of all kinds are campfires. So we really want to avoid building campfires if we can when we're outdoors. Okay. 
So we talked about checking with the ranger or the fire district before you head out, reading those signs on the way out. If you're out hiking and you smell smoke, see if you can figure out where the smoke is coming from. Try to pin it down, make sure it's a safe thing. Uh, if, if you do get caught in a fire, you can't outrun it. The best thing you can do is try to get behind the fire or on the side of it. Uh, you wanna find a place that's sheltered, um, like beaver ponds or lakes, they can be good in a fire, um, or spots with less fuel, like a talus slope or a rocky slope, um, or above timberline, that's a good place to be. Um, you want to, what firemen will tell you to do, wildfire fighters will tell you to do is get in the black. And that photo there is a photo of the black. That's where a fire has moved through. Um, and there's, it's not gonna burn again because everything is burned up. So if you can find a spot for that and you're stuck out there, that's absolutely the best place to be. Um, you might have this notion as I did once when I was a kid, that if I ever got caught in a fire, I'd wet my clothes and then run through the fire. Don't do that. What happens is it's like ironing blue jeans and you spray them um, and you know how hot they can get. Your clothes, if they're wet, will get super hot and you will get burned from your wet clothes. All right, if you're out there and you get lost, um, it can be a very frightening thing, a thing called uh, wood shocks uh, sets in. You wanna try to overcome that, you wanna stop, uh, once you know you're lost, you want to stop, you want to sit down, you want to think, take a deep breath, drink some water, have a snack. Uh, inventory, what gear you have, that will be a very calming thing for you. If you have your 10 essentials, you'll know you can survive for weeks having that equipment. Um, uh, once you start, uh, once you've calmed down a bit, you've inventoried what gear you have, you want to mark the spot where you first got off the trail. And that's known as the FSL first or FLS, the first lost spot. And you can mark it with um, a little tripod there, put something like the flagging tape or surveyor's tape or a bandana or something you will see on it because that's a key place to help you get back. The most likely places to get lost are blowdowns where trees have been uh, uh, hit by a microburst and trees go down across the trails. Um, summits of mountains, can you can get lost easily on those because it's hard to remember which particular route you came up on when they're around top mountain. Trail intersections, um, cutting switchbacks are a very bad place to get lost. Never cut a switchback because it's just bad for the environment, bad for the trail and the forest. But the Forest Service actually has designed switchbacks when they build trails to be steeper than the other part of a trail. And that is to keep people, it's to keep people from doing switchbacks. So if you ever cut a switchback, your chances of losing the trail are much higher. Um, if you take a bathroom break, you know, you want privacy. So you're trying to get away from the trail um, and not be seen and so forth. Um, and that's when people get lost quite a bit. So uh, be careful if you take a bathroom break, take your pack with you. So if you do get stuck out there, you'll be able to survive. Okay. Um, if you are out there, you want to make yourself as visible as you can. You have some of that flagging tape or colored tent fly, hang it up, put on any bright colored clothes you have. Uh, if it's, uh, if you can safely do it, build a fire. Um, the ideal thing is three fires built in a 50 foot triangle, uh, one in each corner of the triangle. During the night, you want to make them as bright as you can. During the day, you want to make them as smoky as you can by putting branches on them and so forth. You can shout for help. Maybe somebody will hear you. Um, you can blow your whistle. The three times of anything in the wilderness, three gunshots, three whistle blows means help. So blow your whistle three times. Uh, that's a sign, universal sign for help. You can signal for help if an airplane comes over with a mirror. Um, you, if you don't have a mirror, you can use a hologram on the back of your credit card. That works. We've tried that. Um, you can use your, your uh, power bar wrapper. Um, that'll, uh, you can signal with that. Cell phones are unreliable. Um, and if your batteries are low, you've got a problem. But um, you can, it takes less bandwidth to send a text message than to send a voice message. So sometimes your text messages will go through when voice messages do not. 
Um, another thing you do is take your phone. Uh, if, you're, if you're having a weak signal, um, search and rescue teams have figured out that just your head it, it is enough mass to block a weak signal. So what they recommend you do is put your cell phone on speakerphone, hold it above your head, and um, talk with it as high as you can get it and away from your phone, away from your head. All right, I'm gonna get us through here real quick. Um, there's a little shelter here. You could build this if it's getting dark. If you, about, if you, have, if you are stuck out overnight, uh, you can build a, a, what's called a debris shelter, which is a pile of pine branches. Pine branches break off very, very easily. You don't need a tool to build this shelter. Um, you can build a pile of branches that's three feet tall and then cover yourself with another three feet of branches. And that'll give you insulation to get you through the night. If you have more time, you can build a shelter like the one you see here. Uh, you put up a wood tripod, uh, then you stack branches up along the side of it uh, and you end up with a shelter. This one I built to take photos of and I checked back three months after I built it, it was still standing. So it's, it's a pretty robust technique. I'm gonna go through animals just super quick. The most common thing and dangerous animal you'll encounter um, the most commonly is a black bear. They can be many different colors. They're very shy of humans, so they usually will leave you alone. Uh, but if they do come after you, they wanna kill you because uh, they don't, they rarely come after you. Um, so be very much alert to that and fight back if they, they do come after you. Make noise if you're in bear country, clap your hands. Uh, some people carry bear bells, uh, people shout, hey bear. Um, if you are camping, if you're backpacking, keep a, a clean camp. Be sure to uh, not store any food at all or anything that smells like toiletries in your tent. Um, you can hang them from a tree. And again, our book explains how to do that. If you do encounter a bear, don't run. You can never outrun a bear. Don't climb a tree. Bears are good tree climbers. If a bear attacks you, fight back, fight. Fight back with anything you've got, binoculars, hiking poles, sticks, uh, even bare hands. If you have bear spray, that is remarkably good. It's got a great reputation. It was invented about 30 years ago. It's widely used and uh, it works 98% of, of the time. If you use it correctly, bear spray will work well. Um, and it doesn't kill the bear like firearms would. Um, and it teaches bears to be afraid of humans. Um, I'm just going to do mountain lions and then wrap it up here because we're running out of time. Um, we have a, we, where I'm sitting right now, I am within 15 miles of the highest mountain lion territory in Colorado. This front range area is highly populated with mountain lions. Um, the good news is their mountain lions are very shy and attacks on hikers are very, very rare. But one reason there are so many mountain lions around where we are is there's a lot of deer around and that's their favorite food. So if you see deer, you know mountain lions are around. If you're ever out hiking and you come upon a deer carcass, uh, particularly if the carcass is pat partly buried, um, covered with sticks or branches, get out of that area immediately. That is what mountain lions do with their kills. They half bury them and then they stay in the area and come back and continue to feed on them when they get hungry again. And they're very jealous and territorial about those game piles. So if you see them, be very, very careful. Um, if a lion does approach you, stay calm, um, be aggressive, look it in the eyes, talk firmly to it, slowly back away. Um, do all you can to appear larger. If you're wearing a jacket, pull out the side and it'll hold it up tall. Uh, look as big as you possibly can. If the lion's aggressive, throw something at it. You can throw your pack at it, you can throw stones, throw branches. Um, if it does knock you down, uh, fight back, get up. I'm gonna do moose because uh, Colorado Department of Wildlife last year said that the most not the most common animal. There's many fewer moose in the United, in Colorado than other animals. There's only about 2,000 of them. 
but they are the most dangerous of all animals. They're big, they got incredible horns, and they are cranky. Um, they're not fun like Bullwinkle or anything like that. Uh, they have a kind of a mean, tough affect. Um, you can get pretty close to them, but if you cross the line into their, per their personal space, um, they can and will attack you. Particularly if there's uh, any kind of um, uh, uh, young moose around, uh, they are very protective of their young. So you never want to uh, get too close to them. You want to stay at least 100 yards away from them if you can. Um, moose are, um, um, eat, are vegetarians. They can't eat you, but they want you to go away. And they will stomp you or charge you. And if that happens, you want to get behind a tree or behind a rock um, and mainly avoid them if you can. Um, if you look at that picture there, you'll see something I did wrong, which is I took that picture of a moose and the moose is looking at me. And that means I've disturbed the moose. With any wild animal, if you ever have them change their behavior because of something you did, uh, that is wrong. You don't want to disturb an animal to change its behavior. And then finally, moose will attack dogs. If you got a dog with you, be super careful. Um, they think they are wolves, which are their biggest uh, enemy. And so you, um, um, it, what happens many times is if a dog's off a leash, it might run over the moose and the moose starts chasing it and the dog will run back to its owner to be protected and the moose follows back to you. So be really careful with dogs and be sure to keep them on a leash if you can. All right, our final slide is uh, other animals to be alert to out there, coyotes. If you see one coyote, um, they're, they almost are always in packs. So be aware that um, there's gonna be more than one around. Um, you want to, uh, again, do back away, look tall, and so forth. Sheepdogs are actually becoming a concern in southwest Colorado. Um, Everybody can't hire enough staff, so they can't hire enough sheep herders. So they put these dogs by flocks, and they are very protective of sheep herds. And you'll run into sheep herds if you are on like the Colorado Trail or a place like that. So be careful of that. If you come upon a sheep herd, go way around it. And then finally, we are getting wolves in Colorado. I'm just gonna end with this. Um, as of December 31st, moose uh, wolves are supposed to be reintroduced into Colorado. There's about a half a dozen wolves in Colorado now who found their way here from Wyoming. Um, if you do run into wolves, um, they will generally try to get away from you. They, don't, they have been so hunted and pestered by man for so many years. They are, they, they're not timid of man, but they'll, they don't want anything to do with you. So if you have bear spray and if you're attacked by a, a wolf, which is unlikely, um, you can use air horns or bear spray. You want to throw rocks at them. You can climb a tree. If there's several of you, you want to put your backs together and slowly back away. But I talk, I'll just end with this. I talked to, um, I interviewed quite a few naturalists and rangers in Wyoming and at Yellowstone and places where root, uh, wolves are very common. And basically the bottom line of what they said to us in Colorado, because I told them we were getting our own wolves, they said, don't worry, it will not be an issue for you. Uh, so we got through it. Let's move on. Um, if, you, if this interests you and you'd like to, uh, Brush up more, we offer our class uh, throughout the year. We have a class coming up in a month um, or next month. Um, it's a three hour class, it'll be here in this building. And then of course we have our new book on hiking safety out, um, which we um, we're proud of and we think it's sort of one of a kind um, and is great for if you'd like to really come up to speed and know the very latest on research. Hear the lightning? <laughs> we're in a building, we're safe. That was a lightning storm. Um, thank you very much. I think um, Sarah will chime in now. Anything? Um, to yeah, thank you so much, Art. Um, everyone, if you have questions for Art, please put them in the chat and we can take some questions now. We have thunder and lightning happening outside, which is perfect. <laughs> yes, and we had a fire engine go by too. So we got the uh, full mountain experience here. 
All right, Christina. Christine, do you have a question? Yeah, I just thought I'd ask. Thank you, first of all, Art. That was really great. And uh, Sarah, um, since you brought up that moose don't, don't like dogs, and if they're off leash, like assuming that your dog is under voice command, what else could you do if your dog encounters a moose? Well, I, I mainly just stay away from them. Um, again, if you cross a territorial line, unless you, you know, people that you run into moose accidentally, um, they tend to travel on trails uh, and wild animals travel on trails like we do because it's easier. So there's a good chance you'll see them more and more. There was a moose where I'm sitting uh, in Golden on the creek last year. There was a moose about 500 feet from where I'm sitting. <laughs> So you can imagine the dogs that are in Golden, Colorado, and so forth. Um, there's really not much you can do. If you got them well controlled, that's great. Um, you might even hang their collar, uh, hold their collar, because they, uh, um, you know, it, it's a very unusual thing to run into a moose with a dog, and they might do something you don't predict. But basically, try to get get away from them. Um, Lynn has a question. Um, about are there any other online classes about this topic? This there is a there are nine classes at the Colorado Mountain Club that are design safety classes. Um, this is the only time we've ever done this online. Um, there the other there is a introductory hiking class that has a lot of safety in it and is very good and that is online. Um, sorry, do you recall the name of it? Um, it's new within the last year. Um, let me look it up. Okay. So yes, you, there's, um, if, if safety is something that interests you and again, safety is something like, if you think of high school, remember elementary school where we had the fire alarms and they practiced them every few months. That was because safety is something you have to revisit and keep your skills up on. You want to, you want to frequently up, upgrade your skills or revisit your skills. So there are nine classes that are considered safety classes, starting with this one, the hiking safety class, uh, the introduction one we've just touched on, and they go all the way up through the avalanche uh, safety classes, which are the pinnacle of the safety classes we offer. Somewhere in the middle is, a, is one called backcountry incident management. And then we also consider our hiking, uh, our wilderness first aid classes as safety classes. And those are great classes and I highly recommend them to everybody. Um, they're a two day class. I'm one of the instructors there. Um, students speak very highly of it. Um, we've all had first aid for the city. Wilderness first aid is a different thing because you, you don't have equipment, you don't have ambulances that can come and pluck you out. Um, it's sort of like long-term care, taking care of people in the wilderness uh, and having to evacuate. So highly uh, worthwhile class. Um, the club offers some really good ones and they're offered once a month. Um, there's also a more advanced class called Wilderness First Responder. If you get interested in the search and rescue sort and the things, that's a, an eight day class that we offer. I put links in the chat for day hiker school and Great. for the backpacking school. Someone asked about backpacking classes. Excellent. Thank you. And the wilderness trekking school is a wonderful school as well. Um, our safety here is on Zoom or in a classroom. Uh, that school gets you out on hikes and you're actually out there in the wilderness and so forth. So that's a, uh, a good step up. Well, folks, um, what a pleasure to chat with you. I hope I get to meet you on the trail and in person. Um, the skills you learned here um, are, the, are uh, entry skills, but you probably know more than 90% of the people out there hiking now. So share these skills with other folks. Um, there are handouts for our classes that you can use without visiting, the, without taking the class. If you go to our website, you can download um, our slideshow from the class if you'd like to uh, study this a little further on your own.
So have safe time out there and have safe trails. I Thank have you. one one question. Okay. Do you have any of, I'll be moving to Colorado Springs in about two weeks. Do they have classes there through CMC? Yes, they do. Um, Colorado Mountain Club has about seven chapters around the state. Um, and Colorado Springs has an excellent group down there. They're real active and they do a lot of nice trips and they got that great Pikes Peak area down there to hike in. Okay, I'll, I'll check that out when I get there. Thank great. you. Thank, thank you, you for your time. This has been great. Thank you much. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Take care. Thanks everyone. We'll see you on the trail. Yeah, thank you.